Good morning, good morning, uh, everybody. I see uh, uh, people are joining us now. Um, and it's a uh, good afternoon for you, Nava, no? Is it, uh, what time is it in Israel? It's uh, six o'clock in the evening. Six, oh, six o'clock in the evening. Yeah, so uh, I'm here today um, with a special guest uh, that are very much involved in what we do and have very interesting stories. Um, um, David Bentel, um, from Vancouver, and Dr. Nava Michael Sabari from Israel. Uh, and Kiran is here helping us technically with some um, issues here. So first of all, good morning. And I would just like to say a couple of words uh, about um, my guest. Uh, uh, Danny, because I see people are still uh, joining, so yeah. maybe... Uh, just a few seconds because yeah, I can speak slowly okay and get there as well so uh, yeah people are still joining um, let me see the Q&A works yeah and let's see participants okay um, so um, um, today I have um, uh, a very interesting session. It's the first session that we're doing with two different uh, people and not just one. And both, they are from different sectors originally. Real estate, uh, Nava, your uh, family uh, business that came from the dairy products, manufacturing, different obviously markets, um, uh, uh, Vancouver and uh, Tel Aviv. Naria originally, and then you see. And, uh, and the interesting thing is both are next generations of families that are highly known in their, in, their, um, in their destinations. And both of you are in the world of uh, Nava research and you consulting to other family businesses. And I just wanna say a couple of words about how I, how I know you both, because um, it's very interesting, I think. Uh, Nava, Nava has been basically with us from the moment we got into the family office space that obviously is today 95% of what we do here at DC Finance. All the conferences we do around the world, everything we've developed started when 11 years ago I uh, read about the family office space and I saw what Nava was um, doing. I heard about what Nava did back then, which is uh, today she does way more. She will talk about uh, her research um, faculty. And as the next generation of a very uh, known family, I asked her if she would be willing to, um, to do this first time event. And in Israel, we have new wealth, we have old wealth, and we have uh, international Jewish wealth. We have different kinds of wealth, different issues, different challenges, all in a small, tiny country. And, and you didn't have a non-biased conference in Israel that really talks about everything that matters. Uh, uh, state planning, next generation, co-investing, philanthropy, arts, and that's what we've done and it grew since. Uh, Nava's mother, uh, Raya uh, uh, Strauss, uh, uh, is gracious to host every single year, sponsor our opening cocktail for our main conference in, uh, in Tel Aviv, and we hold it at Nava's house. And we held several events at Nava's house. So Nava has been with us, um, she's hosting our event, she's advising us, since day one, and we are very, very, and it's like uh, very interesting to, to see her with me now, 10 years or more later, when I'm in Rye, New York, and you're in, 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 in Israel. Um, and we'll talk about the many interesting topics. And David Bento, um, I got to know David when I was sitting at a legal firm in Vancouver in one of my first um, meetings, uh, business um, uh, meetings, uh, to Vancouver. I like the fact that people told me yeah, we'll never make it in Vancouver. Whenever somebody tells me we'll never make it somewhere, we are working twice as hard. And Vancouver is not only a smaller market than those we know, obviously, of Toronto and Montreal. It's also highly segmented with some communities that are very close. And it's a challenging market, but an exciting one. That's why we're, we want to be there and making sure we're there. And then they told me, do you, do you know David Bentel? I said, no, I don't. And they told me, well, look outside. You see that building there? Well, that's Bentel. That's one of them. The Bentel Center is there, and this and that. And then I did some Google. I, uh, and I saw David is everywhere. I was at the beginning of my trip, so I kept on asking people. I kept on asking. I was meeting with legal firms and CPAs and families. 
everyone I mentioned, David Bentle told me, yeah, of course. And I was like, wow, am, 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 am I gonna be lucky if I'm gonna somehow convince him to get involved at our first conference in Vancouver? And that's how this has started. And, 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 and I was very fortunate to have uh, much of David's time already spent with us, advising us. And once we know things are getting back to normal, of course, we'll update you on our conference date. And I'm sure we will leverage uh, uh, all the other des destinations where we're at uh, in Vancouver as well. So anyway, I was, uh, I, I uh, uh, and David, of course, is um, uh, one of the top uh, uh, consultants, uh, next step uh, advisors in uh, uh, Canada today. So, um, and he will be speaking again once things get back to normal at our uh, various conferences, not only in Vancouver. So it's going to be very interesting. So, good morning is what I wanted to say. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we are very well prepared with some questions that uh, uh, we have here. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about, you know, many topics, including, of course, what we are all facing these days. So maybe I will start, um, um, uh, by, I said good morning already. Um, so David, uh, maybe I'll start with, with, with you. As I've mentioned before, you come from a prominent real estate uh, family in Vancouver. Uh, I was talking, I mentioned the Bentle Center, over 1.2 million square foot, was sold for over a billion dollars. Tell me the, share, if you can share with us your story. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dan Danny. A real pleasure to be with you and Nava to join you. And uh, yeah, the story of the Bentall Center is fascinating. M my dad was a keen reader of biography. Those of you who are watching on Zoom, see, I, I love biographies in my office, or uh, lots of them. My father was inspired by the Rockefeller family. And so he went to New York, Dan Danny, where you are, and saw the Rockefeller Center. And he was captivated by the beautiful, uh, flowers and gardens and plazas and fountains, integrated architecture. He thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have something like that, like the Rockefeller Center in Vancouver? And so he set on a quest for 20 years, spent time developing originally four towers, now five towers and the sixth one is underway. And so my dad worked for our family company for 50 years. Uh, Danny, while well, he was there, was voted one of the 100 best companies to work for in Canada. And you would have thought that this would be a wonderful story with a storybook ending. But tragically, as my father celebrated his 50th year with the family business, his brothers uh, got out an adding machine and they counted up the shares and discovered that uh, they had the majority shares. They never thought about it that way. And uh, they took control of the company. And uh, my father was uh, dismissed from the company. And they sold everything. And as you said, the, the Towers were sold last year for a billion dollars, but my uncle sold everything over 30 years ago for a fraction of what they're worth today. And our family tragically lost its legacy and gave up this core real estate. So for me, it's a, really my the story has been a tragic one. But, and and, and you, you didn't still have um, shares in and enjoyed the sales that they've done later on? No, no, we lost absolutely everything. And so it's what gives me passion to work with families because <clears throat> I grew up as, as Nava did, a third generation member in the family company and was, my dad wanted me to lead the business. I was the only one in our, in our generation of 11 cousins working in the company. My dad wanted me to be president of the business and it was all sold. And so I, we had nothing to do with it. We have nothing to do with the business. The, the company continues to bear my grandfather's name. I remember asking somebody, what, why do you still call the name Bentall? And they said, Bentall is a name that can be trusted, but our family has nothing to do with it, Danny. So it's, it's what motivates me to try and help families to have a better result than we got. But your father didn't still have uh, his share. I mean, they had the majority, but he had something. They sold everything. They took it public and sold everything. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, and, and now you tell your story, obviously, around the world, uh, so other families will not, uh, well, one of the reasons, I guess, is that other families can learn from your experience and avoid uh, what you guys went through, uh, perhaps. Well, yeah, and I think people find it refreshing that I'm willing to talk openly about the challenges. You know, it's, it's hard to talk about sometimes, but I try and be very open about what happened to us and how, how, how we could have done a, a better job, and so I, I hope to caution families and, and frankly, to uh, encourage them to 
to have the hard conversations before they become unmanageable. Uh, Nava, Nava. So uh, uh, there's no one that doesn't know who's Strauss that ever lived in Israel uh, at any point, but also around the world. You come from uh, 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 one of the most major companies in the food business industry. Um, the Strauss Group started as a dairy and ice cream factory in Israel. Um, uh, now number seven coffee company in the world. And uh, in North America, that I didn't know, together with PepsiCo, uh, it built the largest salads and dips factory worldwide selling hummus. By the way, my daughter is in charge of 10% of your sales there, just so you know. You, you don't know that, but I'm telling you. Uh, so what's the story behind Strauss? So um, it's uh, in some ways similar to uh, uh, David's story, but also in some ways different. So it started like uh, this uh, traditional beginning of a family business from two cows. Um, my grandparents left uh, Germany after centuries uh, living in, in Germany at the beginning of the Nazi uh, regime, uh, my, my grandmother was wise and she understood that uh, things are not going in a good direction. So they uh, immigrated to Palestine in, in 1936. Um, and my grandfather, he had a PhD in economics and in law and my grandmother studied commerce in France. So they're very educated people. And yet they decided to become farmers uh, in Palestine. So uh, my grandfather fell in love with the cows and he wanted to have cows. Um, the neighbors didn't like the noise and the smell, but he obviously won. So from two cows, uh, my grandmother started uh, to cook um, uh, cheese in her kitchen. And uh, this is generation one. Uh, 80, uh, 85, 84 years ago. Uh, so it became a small dairy and an ice cream factory later on and uh, joined by the second generation, my uncle Michael, who was uh, uh, the eldest brother. And my mother is, uh, uh, as you mentioned, Raya. She's younger, the younger daughter. And my father worked there too. Um, as a second generation, really, really building a sophisticated uh, food company. And then uh, today it's led by the third generation, my cousin Ofra. Uh, she is the chairperson uh, and, and the business has grown tremendously. Uh, uh, it's now public, publicly traded in Israel. And uh, so it's merged with another coffee and chocolate uh, company and uh, the spreads and dips and salads in North America um, is, as you mentioned, is, uh, is a very big uh, hummus, uh, the biggest one in the world uh, together with PepsiCo. It has water in China and things like that. Uh, so it's still a family business, unlike uh, David's story. I am no longer a shareholder. I sold my shares, uh, but uh, my two brothers are shareholders with uh, my three cousins and my uncle, and also my mother sold her shares. So um, it's still a family company, but uh, I'm not a part of it, nor is uh, my mother. But it's a huge uh, two billion turnover, da da da, with dozens of factories around the world. Um, thank you. So, um, by the way, tell me afterwards, how am I as a host? Because this is a new, it's a new thing, right? And I'm, and I'm supposed to be, you know, like a host and, you know, making things cool. You're fine, but it's good <laughs> that you're practicing. I'm sorry? You're fine. You're doing fine, but it's good that you're still practicing. Yeah, I am. I am. I got, today I got lights here, but never mind. Okay. So, um, uh, David, uh, back to you. Uh, and again, the transition, actually, you guys both uh, did. So today, you're a professor at the University of British Columbia. Um, uh, you work, as, a, as I mentioned before, as a family advisor uh, to family businesses across Canada. Um, and by the way, an interesting question, maybe for later, 
is uh, uh, is it just Canada because of a geographical reason or or US uh, families as well how did you make the transition from family business executive to being an advisor great Danny it's, it's interesting because I, I never aspired to be an advisor to families in fact I, I resisted it a bit but uh, the, the law society one day asked me to share my story about what happened in our family and I uh, I thought if I told people what happened to us, it would hurt the reputation of our family. So I was very reluctant to say anything about it. But they convinced me to, to be gentle and to just be open. And uh, that led to other families wanting to hear our story. And I found myself at a black tie dinner for a thousand people in downtown Toronto at the Four Seasons Hotel and just sharing openly about my heart and my life. And uh, I think people found it helpful that I was willing to be vulnerable about it. And you know, we. Friendship, uh, I've heard, is built on the mutual sharing of weakness. So I think if, if, you're, if we're willing to share something of ourselves, people tend to, to warm up to that. So I, I found that people wanted to hear our story. And then how, how can we do it differently? How can we do it better than you? Uh, you, had, you had everything, David. How did you lose that? How can we avoid the same thing? And so I was um, reluctant, Danny, but uh, people kept asking me for, for input. And so the, Finally, the University of British Columbia asked me to, to become the founding chairman of a center for family business studies. And so uh, I began to teach uh, and uh, that led to more opportunities to consult the family. And um, um, Nava, uh, you have uh, a PhD uh, in the area of family business. I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think you were the first, I don't know if there's a second, but definitely the first to do a PhD in family business in Israel, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, you're not wrong. It is the first one. Is there a second or? Yeah, there is already. Oh, really? And I'm helping, I'm helping others and I helped the second one as well. Oh, okay. Uh, and you founded the first and only Center for Family Firm Research at the Collier School of Management at the Tel Aviv University. By the way, by the way, just so I don't forget, uh, the Tel Aviv University, you don't know that, uh, the, Tel Aviv the Tel Aviv University is involved at all of our conferences in Canada, especially in Montreal, uh, yes. Um, the friends of Tel Aviv University, uh, our good friend Sharon, Amos from there are involved, and when they heard that you're gonna be here, they were all very, very uh, excited, and I think we have some families here from Canada and some of them are supporters of the university, just so you know. So anyway, tell us about your transition, again, to uh, research, to that side of things. All right. So um, I too worked in the family business. I worked uh, as an HR manager uh, just after my, uh, my BA. And my mother said, you need to come and work in the family business. Uh, you need to understand, you will later be an owner, so you need to come. And I did. Uh, and as I said, I'm, maybe I didn't say, but I'm, I'm the, the eldest one in the third generation. So I was the first one to, to finish my BA and the first one to come into the business. But, uh, and this is unlike uh, David, I was never meant to, to lead or to to be uh, the Harris of the family business. Um, and, and this is because, and it's easy to, to understand, you know, each family has uh, its own uh, power structure. And in, in our family, since I'm the daughter of the youngest uh, daughter, uh, and, and my uncle is the eldest one, and he has a daughter as well, my cousin who is leading the family business, and we are the same age. Um, so it was meant for her to be uh, the heiress. And uh, this is something I knew and all of us knew. And uh, he prepared her his whole, life, his whole life. So I came to work there, but the, when she joined the, the business, uh, I understood uh, I, I will always be second best. And uh, so I left. And, uh, and then, uh, in the 90s, my mother, who was very, very entrepreneurial, um, and in Israel, we are considered an old family business, like 80, 90 years is old in Israel. You don't have many big 
firms or families that are in, in the third generation, like our, our family. So in the 90s, my mother was uh, struggling with uh, uh, succession issues. And uh, she heard, uh, accidentally, she heard, uh, um, she, she heard a presentation given by some American uh, scholars coming from, from the US talking about family businesses as a field of study which was then just the beginning of the field, the beginning of advisors, uh, just the beginning. So um, she sent me and uh, Ofwa, my cousin, to a, a workshop, which uh, David mentioned before, actually in Canada, uh, with, with a, which was organized by a prominent uh, uh, the Gaspe Bovian family in Canada, I, I guess uh, the Canadians uh, recognize the name. So they were also very, you know, entrepreneurial and uh, forward thinking by organizing a workshop. And this was uh, 1995. So we participated there. All the, the big names uh, that started the, the field were there. Ivan Landsberg and John Davis and John Ward. And um, we asked John Ward to uh, uh, be the advisor of our family business since this workshop. So for about 20 years, he worked with uh, our family to help the transition between generation two to generation three, be between my uncle and my cousin, which took about 10 years. And he also uh, pushed for big changes. One was the family constitution, which was signed in 1998. Uh, and really, it was uh, the basis for everything that happened afterwards, uh, like uh, how to sell shares, how to go out, um, succession, all these issues were agreed upon. And uh, he also pushed for my generation to have shares. So not to wait until um, uh, uh, a later event, uh, unexpected event. So, given, so we, we were given, given uh, shares. Um, and my mother and my uncle kept their majority of 51% and 49 were divided among six cousins. And we had a cousins uh, forum. So uh, uh, this workshop in Canada was for me uh, like a revelation. I, I was, wow, I was amazed that this is really a field and uh, um, the things that uh, occurred uh, in our family and I found them so frustrating uh, were actually similar to stories of others and uh, that it could be analyzed and understood. And uh, for me, it was a life-changing event. And uh, so um, when I left the work in, in our family business, um, and I know it now that I had to grow up myself and not be so frustrated, but also uh, being so, and David, David said something about it before, being such a prominent family in Israel that everybody knows makes it really difficult to talk about uh, your own family or family issues because people always assume that whatever you say is about your own family. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's correct and sometimes it's not correct. But uh, it took me a long journey to be able to talk about um, family business issues without um, being angry. And so after I sold my shares, so I'm not talking about my, my co-owners, I'm talking about the family and uh, I'm, I'm open about it. I, I speak openly about uh, the good things and, 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 the, and, and the bad things and the complicated ones as well. So I, became, I uh, started my journey in doing a PhD. Uh, so I'm teaching over a decade already uh, families. So a course to family members. And after I finished my dissertation, uh, I asked my mother to uh, donate the money to the Tel Aviv University. And we founded, this was five years ago, over five years ago. We um, opened the Raya Strauss Center for Family Business Research at the Tel Aviv University. So my mission, and this is why I helped you over a decade ago, 
my mission is like to open the field and the awareness of other families in Israel um, with the revelation I had that this is a field uh, that there are consultants out there, there is help, there is advice, and um, if I can help families in, in these complicated situations, this is my um, this is my passion, so this is why I do it. So I'm, I'm a researcher, I publish research, I do research. I, uh, I'm a teacher, so I teach uh, students and I teach families. And I do, like I work at Danny's uh, with no salary. Uh, he sends me a beautiful bouquet you of have an emotional salary, that's the salary yeah. that really matters. It really matters, it really counts. So, I get a beautiful bouquet of flowers or chai every time I host a conference, but I do it because uh, because of my passion uh, to give insights to family firms. And by the way, you mentioned the Caspe Bombian, so I'm happy to tell you that uh, uh, I think in two weeks we're having Philippe de Caspe Bombian uh, mm -hmm. at, at one of those sessions, and later on another family member, Nanette de Caspe Bombian. So, uh, wow. We got the right uh, folks. Uh, now, briefly, uh, 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 in the last two decades, what are the most important lessons, David, you learned um, uh, you can share with us? Sure. Thank you, Danny. I think uh, very briefly, I think that, you know, we're talking today, people from New York, you're from in New York and uh, Nava is in Israel. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that families around the world have the same challenges. Uh, and I think, uh, every family I meet, every family that I work with, they believe that they are unique and different. And of course, every family is unique, like a snowflake. There, there's no two families are alike. But the challenges we all face are similar. So that's the first thing I discovered as I began working with families. The second thing that's profound is that the families, we often are embarrassed, I think, sometimes growing up, you know, we're in a family business. We don't want to admit that we're in a family business. But the research, Nava would know this, that Research around the world shows that families in business tend to perform better economically. If you take a, a tire company, that, a tire manufacturing company that's family owned and one that's not family owned, the, the family owned one will tend to do better. And so the family businesses tend to be a better economic model. Uh, and then the uh, third thing I've learned is that the most important thing we can do for families, the most important thing we can do is to help them develop effective governance. So often family firms come out of an entrepreneurial start, as Nava was talking about, you know, her family, they started with two cows and, and now they're one of the largest manufacturers of hummus in the world. How do you, it's an entrepreneurial bent. Uh, family firms grow from an entrepreneurial base, but what is necessary in order for them to survive is to begin to introduce quality governance, which includes boards of directors with independent members, it includes family meetings and uh, so these things are the, so I've, I've discovered these three things, Danny, it's, it's, uh, as I've worked with families around the world. And I, I think, you know, with families, probably it's because they care. They just care. They built it from scratch. They care about it more than any hired person could be. And they never, I mean, it's, it's theirs. So they work 24 seven. They never stop ever, uh, I guess is what uh, it has to do with it as well. And, and Nava, what can you add? I agree with David's points. I, I would just add three points uh, which are you know, characteristic of Israel uh, specifically. Because it's a young country and people have not heard about family businesses before, which is changing now that uh, uh, DC Finance uh, does what it does and I, I do what I do and others. There are many consultants here now. But still, it's a young country. So even you have to persuade family businesses that there is something unique about them, that you can teach them something. They don't recognize that they are different from uh, non-family firms, which sometimes I just need to prove to them that uh, I know something about them. And um, we don't have an inheritance tax in Israel. We don't. Um, uh, so this is a unique uh, circumstance uh, which uh, does not uh, force uh, families to plan ahead because there's no need to. Um, you just uh, give your, your, your wealth to the next generation with no tax. So um, people don't need to plan, which has a very negative uh, outcome. And uh, the last one is, since it's a young country, uh, there is a... Um, 
the majority here on family farms are still in the first generation, uh, which means that you, uh, you meet founders who are very, very strong characters. Uh, they think they know everything. And I would say their, their main uh, mistake is that they think they know everything about their family as well and uh, about their children and what they want and uh, they decide for them what is best for them. And so most of This is of not the, just in Israel. This is not just in Israel. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that. So, but, but, like I face many of them in my classes or lectures and uh, you need to learn how to, uh, how to deal with entrepreneurs uh, to persuade them that if they don't plan and, and do what uh, the, they will refer to as all the governance uh, systems, uh, if they don't do it, uh, their, their life creation might not uh, uh, continue after their lifetime, which is my way of, of trying to persuade them why they should listen mm -hmm. to people like yeah. David like himself. And, um, you know, I always like to speak about, um, and many of my guests spoke about this uh, challenge and how you find opportunities in a crisis. And I think, David, in your case, um, your family business went from construction um, and transitioned to, um, uh, to real estate. Can you share something about that? Thank you. Well, it's fascinating as we've been facing this COVID-19 pandemic, I keep thinking about my grandfather who in the middle of the Great Depression, of course, I wasn't born then, but in the 1930s when the Great Depression hit, that's when our family company started in the real estate business. We started in the, did our first real estate project in the middle of the depression. And you say, well, how, how could that be? And uh, at the time, General Motors was the largest corporation in the world. And we had just built in the, in the late 1920s, we built a, a, a new building for General Motors in Vancouver and they wanted a new building in, in Alberta. And so we were doing the plans and they said, we have to cancel it. The depression is hit, we have to stop. And my grandfather went to the people at General Motors and said, how about if we build the building and lease it to them? And they said that that would be great. They didn't have the money. If we could do it, it'd be wonderful. And my grandfather went home and talked to our VP finance. And he, uh, our VP finance said, do you mean to tell me that the largest corporation in the industrial world doesn't have the money? And we're going to, we're just a little construction. Of, we're going to build it for them. And my grandfather said, if the largest corporation in the industrial world will sign the lease, why wouldn't we build it for them? And so that's how we started in the real estate business. And so this has been in my mind ever since lockdown hit with COVID-19, I've been thinking, we will get through this. And I remember I was on my bicycle riding one day thinking, what, what does this mean for us in our world? I remember thinking, there are opportunities in the midst of this. And I think uh, you know, the, the wisest amongst us are, are looking for what's on the other side of this. We will get through this. Uh, it, uh, yes, it's a terribly challenging time for some, uh, and uh, I feel so fortunate that I have the opportunity to work with families during this period. Some are finding it extremely difficult and challenging, but we will get through this. And I'm, I'm encouraged by my grandfather's example of looking where are the opportunities in the midst of this and knowing that we will get through it then. And I know some of uh, Nava's exciting stories that uh, I hope she can share with us now, but I'll just tell you that I, I just spoke yesterday with our friend, uh, Mitzi Perdue. Uh, you, should, you should all tune to that one. She's the daughter of the Sheraton family. Okay. And the late husband, her late husband is Perdue Chicken. So she's a billionaire from two different sides, if one wasn't enough. And she told me that they started their business, Sheraton family. They did their best in the Great Depression. That's when they started, that's when they grew. So Nava, please. Yeah, I, I, I just start with an anecdote that I told you also before. I, I talked a few years ago with a French family member, uh, I don't know, generation 12 or generation 13, I, I'm not sure, uh, of a European uh, French family doing um, a jewelry for, for kings and queens, like really, really high-end uh, jewel, jewelry. And she said to me, she said to me, um, yeah, we are like a 13 generation family business. We had um, 
we had a break during the French Re Revolution where we didn't work for several years, but then we continued the family business. So this is not a joke. They had a, like a break in the French, during the French um, Revolution, but when, when you, your uh, perspective is long term, this is just a break. And uh, family firms have a longer perspective. So the story of the crisis that uh, I shared with you, Danny, before is that uh, in 1995, uh, my family had um, uh, tried to sell the ice cream factory and had a due diligence process uh, with Unilever, which is a well-known uh, uh, manufacturer of uh, ice cream from Europe. And uh, in the middle of the, the talk in July, which is the the, the uh, the, the middle of the season of ice cream, uh, the ice cream factory in Akko uh, accidentally, accidentally had a huge fire and was burned to ashes. And uh, it was a huge crisis uh, on one side of losing all the summer uh, season. But all, on the other side, like this was in the midst of talking with the new partners of selling them the factory that now no longer exists. So uh, two things happened. One of them was that uh, the loyal employees uh, worked 24-7 uh, and, and scrubbed and washed all the burnt uh, machines uh, uh, in Akko, in the factory. And uh, so their devo devotion was uh, obvious. And the second thing is that my uncle and the management, they talked with the competitors, you know, the smaller uh, factories who also produced ice cream and uh, negotiated with them to have them produce the Strauss products with the Strauss recipes and the Strauss packages. And this is what happened. And, and so the, the season was not lost in the end. And two months later, the, the agreement was signed with the Unilever and they bought 51% uh, of the ice cream, they now, by the way, have the 100%. Uh, we are, this is uh, decades ago. But still, what they saw in the end was uh, the loyalty of the, the employees and, and, and the flexibility of how the family dealt with the crisis. And, and so even though all the machines were not there when the agreement was signed, uh, all the machines arrived, arrived later, so they bought a newer factory with better machines, but they, they bought the, the spirit and, and, and the know-how. So sometimes it looks like a crisis, and it is a crisis, but you can uh, have a positive outcome out of it. And it's now, not the French Revolution, so... I want to talk about the, the, what's going on in the different markets, Canadian and, and Israeli, and I'll start with uh, David. And I'll just say one of the reasons uh, Canada is one of our most uh, exciting markets is when I came there by mistake, I came to Toronto and somebody told me, it's probably the only arrogant uh, Torontanian I've met. Now, he, he told me, um, you'll never get this conference off the ground because families in Canada are private. And even if you do, we know everybody, which is of course, it wasn't true. We had our best ever first time conference in our 10 years of existence in the family office space in Toronto, which meant families are reaching the stage where they want to meet one another. They're not as shy and they are mature, maybe not like in the US, like sometimes a year in, the, in where they are in the process of family business, but they're definitely there. And, and we see the same interest and thirst for knowledge in other cities in Canada. So David, What's going on in your, in your space? How do families deal in Canada uh, with what's going on with the crisis? Well, thank you, Danny. In, in preparation for our call today, I, I reached out to over two dozen families to, to talk with them about what are, what's happening for them. And Kieran, if you can put the slides up, I'd like to share with you just four quick slides that kind of summarize some of the things that uh, we learned from talking with these different families. And I discovered amongst those we talked to that there were five challenges that were common amongst m many of the families. Uh, most families are, are discovering, number one, that revenues are down significantly. Now, that, now that's not true for everyone. It, it, it's very uneven. You know, uh, sadly, I, one of my clients is in the tourism I industry and they, their revenue has gone to zero. They're not allowed to do anything. 
and, and they're thinking that they, that they may have zero revenue for 12 to 18 months. So some are suffering horrifically as a result of revenues being down. Uh, many others, it's more like 10 or 15 percent, and so they're they're having to make adjustments, but but they are able to keep their doors open. Some of them are essential services, so they're they're uh, mandated to stay open. Uh, and then uh, you know there are a few that are up. Some in the food industry, one of my, our clients that exports to 80 countries around the world, they're up about 10 percent since COVID-19. So it's it's very uneven, uh, Danny. Some uh, on average, uh, people are. Are, are down. Uh, one thing that uh, astonished me, I think our listeners might be interested that um, you know, some, some folks are picking up the slack. I remember reading recently that Walmart globally, their, their sales are up such that they've, they've hired 150,000 new employees. Um, many of those would be perhaps temporary, but they're planning another 50,000, so almost a quarter of a billion uh, new employees uh, being Quarter, quarter, quarter of a million new employees being hired. Um, the second thing that uh, families are finding difficult, of course, is keeping, and it's a num the number one priority is keeping their employees safe and um, finding the, how to do that. Uh, obtaining financial support <coughs> has been difficult. The, the governments are announcing support. They're wanting to make it available, but actually getting that has been difficult. Uh, fourth thing that, uh, Families in business in Canada are suffering a disconnect with their customers. Uh, you know, some, some are not allowed to talk to their customers, not allowed to have them in their place of business. And that's tough. Yes, we have technology. We can meet online. We can phone. We can do other things. But that's been a big challenge. And then the last thing that all of the families in business in Canada are facing is the uncertainty. How long will this last? What does this mean for us? And so there's, there's stress and uncertainty. So those are some of the, some of the challenges. Uh, Kieran, if you can go to the next slide, I'd like to talk about some of the positives. Uh, in talking with families, uh, some of them are discovering a huge new efficiencies, being forced to look at how they can look at business differently. They're being forced to do, to adopt new technologies. Some, some, some are early adopters. Some of them are, are being forced now to consider new technology. Uh, there, new, new employee heroes are being born every day as families are... Uh, looking to their teams. Uh, now that you talked about the loyalty in family firms, that family firms tend to have longer uh, serving employees, so there's more loyalty. And discovering new opportunities. One example of a new opportunity, a, a firm that I was talking to are in the automotive business. They never dreamt that people would be able to go wall to wall to buy a car from the beginning of looking at the car online to transacting and then having it delivered without leaving their home. And so, you know, there are new opportunities. Uh, next slide, please. There's just uh, three or four other opportunities that people have discovered. Um, some families are in business are re recognizing that it was, they were long overdue to streamline their operations. And so they've been forced to do that. Uh, they're finding improved communication. Uh, that may sound odd because people are separate, Danny, but uh, people are communicating more because they're more in front of their computer. They're more hanging on to try and maintain communications and they're coming together. A huge positive is families are discovering more family time. I remember talking to a young man. I said, so you, we used to have an hour commute each way uh, to work and back. What do you do with those two hours? And he said, I spend that time with my family. And so it's been a very positive, especially for families and business together. And then, you know, with uh, some of us are discovering that um, uh, we're not allowed to travel. And so we're beginning to think about the fact that there's less unneeded travel uh, imposed on us. And I think that whether it be Zoom calls like this, Danny, or other things, I think that we're going to see a long-term change. And the last slide, if we can just look at it, what are some of the lasting benefits that uh, families are enjoying? One of our family clients said that uh, they think that they'll be able to make a permanent adjustment to probably be 10 or 15 percent uh, leaner in their operations. In other words, reducing costs long-term 15%. Uh, second thing that people th I think are discovering that they can create more uh, unity in their teams by going through adversity. We all know that facing a challenge and overcoming together can be a lasting benefit. And then a third is that some families are discovering that some of their old habits that needed to be jettisoned are gone. We're creating new procedures. 
and finally some are experiencing lower overhead gain. So there's a quick flyby. And the last slide I'd like to just as a thought for all of you to think about, uh, you know, as we think about this time, um, Dr. Swindoll says that we're all faced with great opportunities, brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And, you know, I think that as we've all faced COVID-19, it, it seems like an impossible situation, but many of the families, any that I've spoken to uh, are seeing this as a, a great opportunity. Thank you. Um, and uh, I would like to ask uh, Nava um, about what she sees in the Israeli market. Completely, we have very special folks we have there in Israel. How do they cope with things, right? Yeah, I, uh, I think in Israel, as, as we discussed before, I don't see uh, that it's uh, so different than, than in other countries, but uh, uh, I wanted to add the research that we did in Israel during the crisis of 2008. And my colleague, uh, Professor Dan Weiss, he, he compared the Israeli uh, companies in the stock exchange, the, the family owned to the non-family owned. And during the crisis of 2008, uh, he, he found that uh, family businesses uh, performed better during the crisis. So they, they were not hurt in the same manner or the same magnitude as the non-family firms. And, and they came out of the crisis uh, in a quicker and, and, and in a better position. And these findings, uh, you find them all over the world in different crises. So this is an optimistic uh, uh, view for family firms that they, they not only do they have advantages in performing in, no, in normal times, but also during crises. And um, uh, I just add one point to the two points I, I mentioned uh, previously, um, which is long-term horizon and uh, the better relationships with all stakeholders, they do not fire uh, employees as much as non-family businesses do. Uh, they keep their employees. But the, the third point I wanted to add is they are more conservative, so they are less leveraged. They don't like to take uh, loans and, and, and debt from, from banks as much as non-family businesses do. So they have, on average, which is, you know, for, for a single family business, which is now in a, in, in a crisis that will uh, uh, be fatal, this is maybe not good news, but uh, on average, family businesses will come out of this crisis better than non-family businesses. And if you want uh, um, uh, one point that uh, an advisor said to me, actually two, two said the same thing. They said it's actually an opportunity for the younger generation to rise to uh, the challenge of taking over some responsibilities that the senior generation sometimes is not willing to let go. But now being uh, more vulnerable in this uh, health problematic uh, uh, time, so and suddenly, you know, over 60 is, uh, is old suddenly uh, in this new world. Um, I mean, Madonna for her is uh, dangerous. So this kind of old, uh, which is actually a learning position for family businesses for the senior generation to let go. This is something I heard from advisors. I just uh, shared with you yesterday when I spoke to a very known family that suddenly uh, they said, wait a minute, we don't have anything for next generation. And you know, who knows with what's going on you know, the, the first generation is like 80. It's not a joke. Um, and, and how do you guys deal with it uh, personally, David? Um, uh, what have you been doing in the last several months, I guess, already? Well, two, two or three things really quickly. The, the, the first is uh, during this time, I've had more time in my office. And so I've been finishing up my next book, which will be coming out, God willing, in August. And then as a result of this extra time we've had, I've been working on developing a successor generation training program so that uh, as I've worked with families for the last 25 years almost now, I've uh, discovered that uh, emotional intelligence is an area that I'd like to continue to support and assist next gen uh, leaders with. So we're developing a, an emotional intelligence program 
that we've launched. Actually, last week we began a beta program, inaugural program for, for some family successors. So we've launched a whole new education and mentoring and coaching program for, for successors. So that's been a, a business on the business side. On the personal side, I've discovered uh, my, I took my road bike out of, out of storage. So I've been biking around the park three mornings a week, which has brought some rhythm to my, my life. And, uh, but the happiest thing during this period of time, my, my mother-in-law is 92 and uh, she became a widow nine years ago. And I've always wanted to have her come and live with us. Didn't want her to be on her own. And it took COVID-19 to get her to finally be willing to come. And it's been so wonderful to have the time with her. And it's been a tender, precious time that I, I wouldn't trade for anything. Oh, hello. Inava, uh, I guess uh, you have time to do research. Uh, um, uh, as you've uh, told me the last time we spoke. So what about you? Yeah, I love uh, working from home. So my, my course to family members has been postponed. So it will start only in two weeks or so. Everything went online. Uh, so I work, to, work at home and, and we keep our connection with the families uh, writing uh, newsletters with uh, knowledge and insights. And uh, the nice thing is I, I work with several groups uh, of scholars from Australia, but from, uh, uh, one is from Vancouver. Uh, from, from other places in the world, I, I, I work with someone in Berlin and, and the situation everywhere is the same, which is a very unique uh, experience. And you talk about the, the same things and everybody is in the lockdown and everybody is experiencing the same thing, which is a very, very unique uh, experience. So uh, I think things will change because of this crisis, but on the other side, people will push to come back to normal very quickly so both things i think will go on and i think uh, that the changes will be subtle and uh, uh, go deep and it, it will take some time until we will see them this is how i feel about it um, when, when do you think we're back to normal flying going to conferences everything when I don't, conferences, I don't think conferences, like the conferences, the academic conferences have been cancelled. So, uh, by the way, it's Vancouver. Academy, uh, Academy of Management should have uh, uh, started uh, in Vancouver uh, in August. It was just cancelled. Some of it will be online. Um, so, so I think this summer... Uh, there will uh, uh, there won't be any academic conferences, and I think actually people will not take the risk of flying. It's better to be where you are certain about you know if a anything happens to you. So it will take time, I think, until we'll be uh, physically again. I think only next year. Danny, I noticed there's a question from one of our viewers. Did you want to read the question? I'd be pleased to try and offer an answer. Sure. What, um, what point generation do you think a family needs to start thinking about selling the business, buying out other family members in order to not tear the family apart and keep the family's legacy going? Great. Thank you. So I appreciate the question. You know, at what point should we consider selling the business uh, or buying other family members out? It's fascinating to me. So the, the assumption is that if we don't do that, we're going to have potentially families torn apart. And I guess the first thing I'd say is that different families have different circumstances. You know, the, I think that the oldest family business that I'm familiar with is the Zildjian Symbols family business. You know, they're 13 generations. So, you know, so some families can carry on for generation after generation and some it's just not destined to be. So I, I, there isn't a one answer for every family. But I think that the, the most important thing I'd, I'd like to share is that I think we want to place members of the next generation uh, or put gen members of the next generation in a place of choice. <clears throat> and I think that I remember thinking about my father. He, he wanted my sisters and my brother and I, there were four of us, he wanted us all to be the same. I, I used to joke that two boys, two girls, if, if he could have dressed us all the same and lined us all up, he, he, he wanted us all to be the same. 
and uh, when we decided to deal with our family construction business, when my uncles took the real estate public, we, we had the opportunity to buy the construction business and we each made a different choice. My brother chose to be a non-owner because he was happy to sell. Uh, one of my sisters chose to be an investing owner, owning shares, but not involved. Uh, one of my sisters chose to be a governing owner. She wanted to be an owner, but involved in the board of directors. And I had the opportunity to be a managing owner. So working in the business as well as a shareholder. And I think the first and most important thing we can do for families is to place the next generation to uh, provide them an opportunity to be at a place of choice. And then the second thing I think we need to do, Danny, is to make sure that there's an opportunity for dialogue and discussion. Because uh, if, we, if we do not have dialogue and discussion, then we have families that are pulled apart. If we have dialogue and discussion, then we can hopefully create either a shared vision or uh, an opportunity to create uh, a vision that would accommodate uh, different uh, opinions and different uh, avenues. Now, I don't know what you would add, but uh, I think it's never too early. I remember our our mentors, the, the Gaspé Bobian family, I remember they said, when should you start having family meetings? Uh, and uh, Philippe's answer was, I, I, should, I think we should have started having family meetings before, their, before our children became teenagers. And uh, Nambi responded, she said, I think we should have started having family meetings before our children were born. So it, there's, it's never, never too soon, I think. Nava, what would you add to that? Yeah, I, I would uh, add that, uh... I think that, uh, you know, you and I were born into family businesses. No one asks us if we want to, to be part of a, a family firm. And I think that during the first generations, like first, second, for sure, uh, there is a strong um, uh, uh, implicit assumption that uh, the family will, will manage. And, and all the energy is... Uh, focused on the firm, like how the firm will do and, and how, how we will build the firm and it's a survival of the firm. And the longer uh, the family firm exists, the, the more it needs to invest into the family side, which is uh, taking for granted for a long, long time. So this is what John Ward started to do with our family. He said, uh, you take for granted that you have these six cousins, but uh, it's almost uh, like we have a, a difference of 10 years be between myself and my youngest brother. So, so it's not the, exactly the same generation, not exactly the same problems, but you need to learn how to be owners together. And, and he uh, founded the Cousins Forum for us. And so we had cousins meetings uh, for many years, which taught us to, to, dis to, uh, to discuss issues and to, to be together as a group of family. And uh, I think the family institutions are super important, um, but uh, th there needs to be an acknowledgement of how important family uh, uh, processes are and how important it is when I teach the families who come to my course, I tell them that uh, after 30, 40 years of the family business, you need to decide whether you want to be a, a family that does businesses together. Now it's a decision that you have to, to make. And um, if the answer is yes, it means you need to invest in, in, in meetings, in governance, in having a, an agreement. Uh, you need to decide who, who may come come into the business? Can anyone come? Can in-laws come? And uh, if you don't want to be a, a family that does business together, then find a solution of maybe uh, people who could leave if there is a process in place. Uh, in any case, and scholars now uh, call it uh, from a family business, it becomes a business family because later on, not all the family is involved Sometimes no one is involved in management, and then it is a family that has assets, which it manages together, and maybe the, the main asset is sold, and the family is coming to Dani to his conferences to manage the wealth together, which has advantages to manage wealth together. So there is a transition, and you need to, 
to acknowledge that it, it changes between generations and across time. And I think that uh, the, the work that uh, David does and other advisors is life-saving. I, I cannot say otherwise. I think but do you see ever that these things go smoothly? I mean, we always say the third generation, 10% of family businesses across the world in different cultures survive this. And you see the struggle in next generation in so many sectors. I mean, do you know, uh, you probably don't, uh, but I will tell, share with you, even Frank Zappa that wrote amazing music. Do you know that his children don't speak to one another today because they had a fight over whether one of the children should uh, take the rights of his music and play it? or not, they don't speak to each other. And in your family, uh, in, in, in Osim, a very known Israeli company that merged, uh, was bought by Nestle, Nestle. and they, uh, there the family decided no family uh, uh, member will be in yeah, the company. Only, the only thing is they are seven families, it's not one family. Right, who owns which makes it even more complicated. Seven, seven families who own Osim. Yeah, and in your family, you guys did the right thing, but again, I, I assume that there's a huge emotional toll you pay because even if somebody professional comes and say, she should lead, you should move out, you should do this. And even if you agree, you're like, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm happy with that. Did you, with all the families you work with, do you even see some that actually managed to make that transfer nicely or there's always yeah. emotions and somebody getting hurt along the way? What do you mean nicely? If you work on, if you invest the effort and take advisors and, and, and do, uh, what is necessary, then it might not be easy and emotions are everywhere and whatever we do um, uh, could be emotional, uh, but uh, some families manage, you know, if, if, this, uh, uh, if this panel is about a crisis and overcoming it, you can see succession as a crisis that uh, is also an opportunity because families get to talk about issues, get to plan ahead, and uh, can find a mutual goal, a mutual identity of doing things together across generations. And some families find this uh, a worth living mission and, and, and a passion of doing things together. So, uh, you, but you need to invest in it. Nothing comes, you know, no free meals, not yeah. even for family firms. So you need to, in order to become a successful family business or business family across generations, you need to invest time and money and sweat and tears uh, and take advisors and go to courses and read books and come to panels and open your heart. And um, it's an and opportunity. Open your mind. Yeah. Danny, I'd just like to add lots of, you mentioned emotion and potentially emotion can be a challenge. One of the things that I remember speaking once in a family, a woman who led her family business put up her hand and said, David, how can we keep emotion out of our families and business? And, and <laughs> frankly, you know, emotion is what provides passion. So I think what we want to do is harness the emotion because it's our passion and commitment that creates value and creates so much uh, excitement around a business. And so it's, it's as, as uh, Nava said, it's, it's learning how to dialogue and communicate and learn together. So it's, uh, and you know, we, we hear about the statistics about 10% of only 10% of families survive to each generation. The statistics are quite misleading, Danny, because only one third of families make it from G1 to G2 and only one third of those make it from G2 to G3. Those are the statistics. One third of one third is, is about 11%. So it's just, it's the same every generation, approximately one third make the transition. So it's not harder to from G2 to G3, it's just one third. But, the, but what's really misleading about those statistics is that if a company went public and were sold, that would be considered a success, a, a failure according to those statistics. You know, if, if the family decided to, to uh, um, liquidate their assets, that would be decide, that, that would be determined a failure under those statistics. So I think those statistics are, are quite misleading. I think what we need to focus on is what Nava was talking about, is how can we help the next generation to prepare? And, uh, and for me, the, the, the answer is to encourage members of the next generation to discover their passions and to discover their dreams and, and enable them to do that. 
uh, I remember Dr. Lee Hausner said that uh, we need to think about what the purpose of the money is. Is the purpose of the money to destroy the next generation or is the purpose of the money that we have in a family business to help the next generation achieve their dreams, to help them grow their own intellectual, emotional and, and uh, financial capital. So uh, I'm not afraid of emotion. I think we just need to learn to harness it. And um, um, we have here a question, how soon should a family start thinking about bringing outsiders, professional executives into the core of the family business and perhaps set up a family office? Ava, do you want to answer that first? Or do you want uh, I would say that uh, actually this is the story that uh, Danny referred to at the beginning. Uh, one of the reasons our first succession in my family from my grandfather to my uncle succeeded, even though my grandfather died suddenly from a heart attack when he was 66 years old, so he was young, and he, di and he died, you know, one day he was here, the next day he wasn't. And uh, the reason uh, this succession uh, uh, was successful um, was that uh, at the time, even though it was a small family business, we had an outside board. So we had a board with outside members who were part of it. And uh, this board kept the management uh, continuity um, and helped my uncle to uh, gain his uh, CEO position as, as uh, you know, as abrupt as this transition has been. And uh, I, I advise the families uh, to have outsiders uh, and have a, they have trusted advisors anyway. So it's uh, the accountant, it's the lawyer. lawyer. And uh, in my family, it was the same way. It was the lawyer and it, it was uh, like the best friend who had another business and he was a, uh, uh, on the board and things like that. So you have your closed network of advisors anyway. So better to have them in the board. And um, so for us, it was before the business was very large. It was before we were public. Uh, and I think it's an advantage, but it depends on each family and about the mm -hmm. circumstances. So I guess, David, uh, you have more experience uh, accompanying and, and advising to families in these uh, transitions. Well, and I think that the questioner was also asking about not only board members, but senior executives. When should we bring senior executives who are not family into the inner circle? And I don't think that there's a, a, one, a one size fits all answer. Mm -hmm. I'm, immediately what comes to mind to me is the, the Nordstrom family, of course, enormously successful uh, retailing company in, in the United States. And for 68 years, two different generations, the, the company was led in one, one generation by three co-presidents and then uh, were all family and another four co-presidents, three brothers and a brother-in-law. And so in that case, the core management team was all, all, all family. And we, you know, would we be right to say, no, they should have had somebody not family in that, in that circle. On the other hand, when my dad started our, uh, our uh, business in Alberta, he brought in one, his VP finance and made him a partner uh, when they signed the papers to form the company. So, Danny, I think that the answer is that we, uh, we want to have the best, uh, best practice, I think, is to have the best talent at the table. And if the family can, can provide that, the best talent, then, that, then they deserve their place at the table if they they don't have the capacity to lead in a competitive environment, then we need to invite non-family to be at the table. And, and more often than not, I think that means we're gonna to want to have non-family at the core of the, of the management team because not, not every family can provide the yeah. talent necessary to, to win. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, it's correct. And I'll just give uh, two examples of two of the biggest family businesses in Europe uh, who have the opposite uh, decision and, and both models uh, exist. So uh, there is a French family uh, by the name of Muyer and the Muyer family is like the richest, I guess, the richest family in France. Uh, they have hundreds of companies, uh, uh, privately uh, held uh, companies 
Uh, they have Decathlon, they have uh, Oshan, they have very, very big businesses. And they believe that family members who want to work in, in the firm are allowed to do so. And so some family members work there and like Oshan is uh, led by a woman who is a family member. On the other side, you have a German family uh, company. And by the way, the Muriel family, there are over 600 shareholders in the family. Uh, big, big family. And uh, the grandfather had 11 children. And so their tradition is of enormous family. And uh, in a German family uh, by the name of Haniel, uh, which is also a huge, huge uh, family business, they, uh, over 100 years now, uh, believe that the family member should not work in the family business. And there is a separation between ownership and management completely. So you have two families who are very, very successful, billion of uh, turnover and hundreds of shareholders, very, very uh, sophisticated uh, um, uh, ownership structures, and yet two different decisions led to two different solutions. And uh, the beautiful thing is they, they both uh, do well. So it's a, it's a family's decision. There is no uh, one answer fits all solution here. Now I have, I have more questions here, but uh, as, I, as I suspected, we'll not get to everything because we have some uh, questions from a couple of folks here. And um, um, so one is asking about the, uh, the pandemic crisis will do good or bad to family businesses, wealth, wealth management. I guess they're asking about wealth preservation uh, these days, in what aspects, uh, Will it be affected? Um, and then uh, the other question is, are more families uh, in 2019 investing in the emotional side of succession? Millions uh, uh, in CPA and lawyers, yet dialogue and discussions is so important. In your experience, are more families investing in the emotional side of succession? These are two uh, different questions. Go, go ahead, Nava. Um, I, I don't know if more do invest uh, in emotions. Uh, by the way, I'm a, an emotion uh, scholar. So emotion in, in organizations is actually uh, the field uh, that I did my dissertation in. Um, so I would say, and this is, I think, uh, I'll try to tie it to the uh, crisis in the end. Uh, Emotions have been seen or have been regarded as feminine and belonging to the fam to the like the, the women who are responsible for the family. They are responsible for emo the emotional side as well. Uh, it's a well-known saying that the the, the mother is the, the CEO, which means she's the chief emotional officer of the family firm. So also uh, studying emotions in organizations, uh, uh, it's a, it's, it, has, it, has, it has been so that up until a few decades ago, emotions did not belong in the business arena at all. Like uh, analytic analyzation, yes, uh, logic, yes, uh, but emotional uh, uh, perspectives, no. Uh, so over over like 30 years already, we know uh, that emotions are part of any organization period. So you cannot do without emotions and they are there and they influence every process and every uh, outcome. Uh, uh, so obviously in, in organizations as well. So to disregard them is in my eyes not realistic. And I know there is a, you know, America, and th there is a cultural difference because America, the U.S., is the country in the world with the widest gap between emotions and, and, and the employment setting. So this saying of check your emotions at the door because they don't fit here in, in, in the organization is an American uh, way of doing normal management in organizations. But I think uh, this, this has been changing, uh, not, not quick enough. Um, but I always say, you know, in, in, you have a, the head of the CIA in America is now a woman. 
So I, I guess uh, uh, women leadership uh, becomes, it's, it takes ages, but women leaders um, are, are uh, uh, already more than, than like the generation ago. Um, and tying it to the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis, um, there is almost no country led by a woman leader that did, uh, uh, that did badly during this crisis. Because women leaders, uh, it could be Finland, it could be New Zealand, it could be, I think, Korea, Taiwan, I don't remember which countries, but where women leaders uh, were leading this, during this crisis, they did well. And I think there needs to be a balance between the feminine and the masculine sides of management. And Germany, Neva, I'm so glad that you're talking about women leadership. You know, in British Columbia, the province that I'm from here, you know, Dr. Bonnie Henry has been the, has been the chief um, health officer in British Columbia, and she's become a hero because she's done, she's provided such steady, consistent, wise leadership. Matter of fact, they've now, a, a, a local firm has uh, created a new shoe that is the Bonnie Henry shoe and they sold out immediately because she's become a hero, a rock star, but, but wow. she's providing amazing leadership. And uh, I think that uh, you're, you're speaking wisely about the importance of us making more room for women leadership. Now, I, when you, you were talking about your dissertation being about <clears throat> emotion uh, in family business, and then you switch to talking about women. Could you comment on the, the connection between women leadership and emotion? Are they, do you, is your, do you have a comment on, is there more wisdom there and how they handle their emotions or what is the, what was the, what were your connection? No, it's, it's just that uh, being emotional is stereotypically connected to the stereotype of women. So this is why I said it, but uh, in my research, and you know, when I came to my supervisor, which was like a decade ago, and I told her, and she's an expert in emotions in organization, a leading one in the world, and I told her there's something unique about the emotional climate in family firms, and she, she didn't believe what I said. She said, can't be. And I said, I grew up in a family business, and I know there is something uh, unique there because in a family business it's allowed to be more emotional than yes. in non-family firms. Like emotions belong to the way uh, people manage uh, the everyday uh, uh, practices. So it, it, it's it's allowed to be more angry. It's allowed to be more more sad. It's allowed to be happier. So the display rules. Th these are called display rules. It's allowed to display more emotion. So this belongs maybe to the paternalistic uh, way of managing, uh, the family influencing the firm. You know, we could go many directions, but this is this happens to be so. I know because this is my dissertation. I found it to be correct that uh, you have more emotional displays in family firms, and I think it's one of the advantages of these firms because the rational and the emotional are more balanced in these firms and, and people take um, advantage of the emotional side as well as the analytical and, and the uh, rational side. So, so I think it's an advantage of, uh, uh, you, you know, this world is so complex and you need complexity also in dealing with it. And family firms have this complexity built in because it's two systems of family and, and business which for normal organizations cannot coexist together. And for family businesses, this is taken, taken for granted. So I think you would agree with me, wouldn't you? I would like to, um, because we've been uh, going for uh, uh, an hour and 20 minutes, and it will be the longest webinar uh, ever here. I want to combine a couple <laughs> of questions together. I told you we will need another one. But anyway, um, because the epidemic is what got these things, the, the, the series started to begin with. Uh, I would like to ask you this, and David, if you could also, you know, in one word, uh, just tell us a little bit about your book that will be distributed at our conferences later on. But... My question regarding the uh, epidemics, I'll really combine two questions is, 
you know, the winners and losers um, of this, uh, of what's going on, who do you think will, impact, will be impacted uh, positively uh, other than Zoom uh, and, and Walmart uh, and who uh, are ne negatively going forward and the, the uncertainty of the future. What advice do you have, which maybe is the most important thing out of this conversation uh, for our listeners to help them deal with their fears and, and what's going on here? Now that you want to go first, you want me to? No, you, you, you go first. So, so I, get, I guess in terms of the, who's going to be impacted, you know, Danny, as you know, my background is in real estate and I immediately think about the, the, the long-term impacts in the real estate sector and the, uh, you know, we already were seeing in previous decades a move away from bricks and mortar real estate or retail to more online. And I think that uh, there's been a, a, a much larger shift. There's been a forced shift. We're not allowed to go shopping in, uh, in person uh, in many cases. So I think that I think that that's going to have a very significant impact, a lasting one on the you know, re on retail real estate that, that that industry. And similarly, the hospitality industry related to hotels and restaurants. I think there's going to be a a longer term impact. I, I I believe people will go back to hotels. I believe people will go back to restaurants. But I think that there will, I think we've discovered uh, that uh, we can order uh, alcohol or food online more easily. I think there, I think there will be a lasting shift there that, that people will, will uh, continue to do some of these things, some of these new patterns. And so you mentioned Zoom, but I, I do think that as an example uh, in the family business uh, arena in the last couple of months, couple of families I've been working with, we've been negotiating shareholders agreements over Zoom. We've been doing recruiting of boards of directors over Zoom. I do believe that, that there will be uh, an increased uh, 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 welcomeness or uh, uh, adoption of using technology in areas we never dreamt. I never would have dreamt of negotiating a shareholder agreement on a Zoom call. I never would have dreamt of, of, of recruiting boards of directors that way. So I think that there will be that, that means people will use technology differently in a permanent way. And I think there will be some less travel. My wife and I are actually hoping I can do some more of my work long-term from home. So I think those will be some of the changes. And then in terms of um, dealing with fears, Danny, if I could just jump to the second part of your question. Uh, qu three quick things. We're not, COVID-19 is not over. Yes, we're seeing the, the flattening of the curve. But for me, there's three thoughts I would offer to the, listeners today. The first is the importance of taking a long-term view uh, to deal with our fears. We will get through this. And I think being confident of that helps us to manage today. Uh, and uh, you know, my, my sister is um, a, a courageous woman who's 32 years in recovery as an alcoholic, uh, but she continues to do that one day at a time. As you, as you know, uh, Al Al Alcoholics Anonymous talk about the importance of one day at a time. We're, we, we still have a long ways to go before things will return to normal. And the key, I think, is to take a long-term view that we'll get through, but one day at a time. Uh, there's two other quick thoughts for me that have helped me, da Danny. Uh, one is to create new rhythms. Um, I mentioned to you bike riding earlier. So I bike ride three days a week, yoga one day a week. And uh, we do, we, Grandma is living with us. We're, we're watching movies every evening. Uh, watching uh, Netflix uh, miniseries together. So we've created new rhythms, which, which uh, I think have been critical. And then the final thing, my, again, my sister taught me to begin every day with three things I'm thankful for. And I think if we cultivate gratitude, these are the things that Danny, uh, that can help us to face our fears and manage them day at a time. And I guess as a footnote, um, I would encourage our listeners to, to not spend every day all day looking at the news because uh, uh, that, that can be discouraging. And I think we need to be, be alert and aware, but uh, be careful to not take all of our time and devote it to the challenges. I've developed a new strategies on how to scream at five kids in three different floors at the same time, which is very important. And I don't know about you not traveling. I'm planning now that I'm, uh, I had so much quality time with my family, I'm planning my, uh, my um, next trip. That's gonna be two and a half years of, of going from one city to another because I have to. I really w would suffer being so far away and at the Four Seasons in, in Toronto, but um, you know, this is life. Nava. <laughs> I would just add that uh, I, I, I fully agree that we need to count our, our blessings and uh, 
even though I, I, I was on, on vacation and unemployed for a month and a half, I will not starve. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, we need to see how fortunate we are with what we have. And um, if anything, I think uh, family firms uh, as being more social responsible, and this is from, re from studies showing that family firms care more about uh, the environment and their stakeholders. And I think um, the people who can will have a bigger, um, bigger uh, part or there will be a bigger need for people who can share uh, knowledge and, and, and share, uh, like help others. So I, I hope that this, uh, um, this crisis will, uh, uh, will not widen the gap between the extremes in society, but somehow uh, show the similarities and, 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 and the responsibility for, for us sharing a, a mutual uh, uh, destiny. So I, I don't have specific answers, but I feel that uh, uh, people who are privileged, and I think being a third uh, generation of a family firm, at least I feel privileged, and it makes me, it pushes me to think about what I can give away uh, to others uh, who are not as lucky. And Even though know, it was frustrating at times, it is still a, a big, 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 uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, responsibility or, or advantage or, so I'm, I'm thank thankful for it. What did you want to say, Danny? I, I, I spoke to, uh, I don't know if she's with us uh, now on this call, uh, Patricia Saputo the, uh, the other day. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and I spoke before that with the philanthropic fund and they said, you know what, we don't think during these times people care about philanthropy. I mean, they have other things to worry about. And yet uh, she told me, I, I just got off from a, a call on our philanthropic uh, uh, um, you know, activities and I was like, very much surprised. And then I spoke to uh, Silverstein uh, not too many know that uh, uh, Lisa Silverstein is highly active now in, in providing masks to people in, in the city. So people are still active in philanthropy, even though they have way more uh, issues to deal with these days, which is very, very heartwarming, I would say. Yeah. Well, and, I, and, and Danny, one, we probably should wrap up soon, but in terms of philanthropy, you know, one of the things that I've encouraged families to do is to think about philanthropy as a way of involving the next generation in leadership. And I think that it's one of the things that families can do as a way of, of providing an outlet for leadership and the next generation, perhaps before they are ready or wanting to be leading in the business. So I, I celebrate the, the emphasis on that in families. So uh, I would like to tell you guys, this is the longest one we've ever done. And I promised you it would be the longest one we've ever done. And people still have questions, which I'm throwing away. Uh, we probably need to do another one of those. Um, uh, so, um, before I let you guys, uh, if you have any last uh, remarks for this session, you mentioned, David, uh, that um, uh, there, you guys have a rock star in Vancouver, the woman uh, in your province. Henry, Henry, yeah. So, speaking of rock stars, I always find those connections that are weird. So, speaking of rock stars, just so you know, I want you to clear Thursday, because my next session this week is going to be with a uh, very interesting first generation. Matt Sorum, who is the ex uh, Guns N' Roses drummer, Velvet Underground, The Cult. He played with Elton John. He played with Alice Cooper, Steven Taylor. Uh, you name it, he played with them. And he's a philanthropist. He's an environmentalist. He's a tech advisor. And he's an amazing person. So Thursday, we do it at 1 Eastern Standard Time because he's in LA. Uh, oops, we should have done it with you too, David. But uh, just so you know, you should uh, come with us. Yeah, so, uh, and join us. Uh, it's gonna be fascinating because I like to hear different views from different you know, families. Anyway, if you have any last um, uh, remarks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you, uh, David, for, uh, for everything. My pleasure. Danny, I, I think it's been great. Thank you for getting us together. I think that one of the things that I would say, you know, we've, we've been thinking about COVID-19 and we've been thinking about families and business, but uh, a family business isn't a family business without a family. And so my last word is let's make sure that we keep family first in all we do. So 
thank you very much for inviting me today. Thank, thank you, you very much. And, 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 and you all have stories. I know you personally, so I know your stories way more than we're able to uh, talk about today. I would uh, definitely encourage you to do uh, with us more webinars. Uh, each has an exciting story. So uh, I will convince you over the phone uh, next week. So thank you very much. Stay safe, Israel, Vancouver, New York. This is like a Eurovision song contest now. Uh, only it's not in Europe. So thank you so much and stay safe, my friends. And I hope to see you with us at our next sessions. Thank you, Dan. Bye now. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.